Our fourth speaker is Reverend Dr. Amy Green, an ACPE supervisor and director of spiritual care at the Cleveland Clinic Foundation in Cleveland, Ohio. She is an ordained Alliance of Baptist minister, and she supervised more than a dozen supervisory education students and has been involved in the processes of countless others based on her passion for training for the next generation of leaders in ACPE. Please welcome Reverend Dr. Amy Green. Thank you. Yeah, I'll do it. Thank you. I should never have agreed to go last. And I should also say that um, I've been involved in the processes of countless others, not by their request. Um, let me just be clear. I've insert myself into their processes, and I'm sure they'll be happy to tell you who they are. Um, a preacher friend I used to have back in Atlanta used to say, if you can't strike oil after 15 minutes, quit boring. So I think that's a great rule of thumb, and I think the three today so far really knocked it out of the park and uh, definitely struck oil. I wish I had not agreed to go last, but here I am. And I made myself, this is my version of PowerPoint. Um, John Roach is like super... Uh, sweet and forgiving, because I'm like, I don't really do PowerPoint, but I do do note cards, just so I won't ramble too much. So one thing is, yay for this new format, huh? I mean, I, it's pretty cool, right? Um, and yay for some forward motion. I mean, I don't want to get into a big certification scandal, but yay for some kind of forward motion on this long, long, long process. Really. Seriously. I want to know, I want you guys to raise your hands if you know what was the shortest process to becoming a supervisor in our family history. And those of you who have already quizzed you on this, don't, don't shout out. But what do you think it used to be possible in X amount of time to become a supervisor? Yeah, great. With? One unit. Three months. Three months. You sat with him, invariably, at that point. And you watched him work, and then you kind of did it the way he did it, and then he signed off on you, probably also a he, and that was it. You were done. And so we've gone all the way from three months of training to uh, 12 years, 15 years. Like, <laughs> raise your hand. Yeah. No offense, but it's kind of a long process. So yay for speeding up something, what, whatever we end up with. And yay for trying new things. I mean, I love that we're here in Austin, which is a cool town, a very cool town. And I love the theme of innovation, and, I'm, and again, my apologies about the whole uh, PowerPoint thing. So um, what, <laughs> the other thing that happened is I just kind of got thrown off. Like, I got here, and as always happens at these things, you know, stuff happens that you don't expect to happen. And I spent the whole morning in Judy Ragsdale's unbelievable workshop. I mean, I was thinking, how can, I mean, three and a half hours, really? It flew, because the work that she is doing is so important and so much more actually relevant to what I have to say than what I have to say. Um, because I want to talk about supervisory training, and I did, I did my D-Men research project on that, but I mean, I cannot hold a candle to Judy Ragsdale. All I can say, where is she? All I can say is, thank God, long life, long life to Judy Ragsdale. Because honestly, she is drilling down on some of this stuff in a way that is so exciting and so important and might actually, I've told her, you know, no pressure, but it might be the key to having ACPE not go extinct in our lifetime. Because I think we are on the verge of a lot of, of, a lot of really important decisions, a lot of really important changes. We have got to change or die, folks. We do. We have to change or die. And I don't just mean the ACPE, I mean all of us. We have to change or die. Well, we have to change and then die. But it's no fun. You know, it's no fun. Because we all have to let go of something old in order to make room for something new. I mean, that's really simple and really basic, but it, sometimes it sucks. Um, we can't do anything new until we let go of the old. And that causes us a lot of grief and a lot of pain. And we come up with a lot of great rationalizations why we shouldn't change. Um, but I think that's mostly grief. So the thing that I was invited here actually to do was to talk about my, uh, my little project that I did a couple years ago and um, what I learned in the research. And what I wanted to talk about was, A, what I started noticing 
at these meetings, which is that we're not getting any younger. Newsflash. Now, but I don't just mean like the supervisors. I mean the people that we're certifying are also not getting any younger. Now, no offense over there at the table. We'll celebrate you later. <laughs> we're very happy about you. We're very happy about you. I would be happier if there were three more tables of people under 40. I know there are a few of you. But we're, we really need to know where the next generation is coming from. And I don't know that we know that yet. And I don't know that anybody, I would love some company to be as worried about this as I am. I really feel actually worried because we have so many boomers. And, and if all of us decide to retire when it's time or when it's reasonable to think about retiring, unless we're like Peter Keese and we're never going to stop until we're 100. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I just insulted you, yeah. So um, unless, we're <laughs> unless we're Peter, you know, we might eventually retire. And if we all decided to do that in the next 10 to 15 to 20 years, there's going to be like five supervisors left unless we get serious and, and get, get going on recruitment, on encouragement, on looking for better ways of selecting our students, on preparing them, on uh, really getting serious about um, who's coming up to take, take the helm? I think we've been given such an amazing legacy to be able to do this work. We, it's just an incredible honor. And for us to be so short-sighted that we don't think about who's going to be doing this 20 and 30 years from now, when, except for maybe Peter, most of us will be done. Um, what are we going to do about that? So I, in the spring of 2011, I decided to do a survey for my a doctorate in ministry, and I um, wanted to study the supervisory process. I wanted to learn some things about that and what were the most important components of that for people, and I, wanted, and I polled the CPE uh, supervisory population. Thank you very much to those of you in this room who answered the survey. Uh, the survey went out to 825 people were on the list that I got from the main office of active and retired supervisors. Of that number, 50 bounced back, so there were only 800 sort of active live email boxes, which was, you know, I figured that was pretty good that only 50 didn't, hadn't even started using email. So <laughs> to your point, Mark, you know, like, wow, that was, that was pretty good. Well, I sent it three times in order to make sure that I got as many responses as I could. And um, my husband said, send it again, send it again. And I was like, okay, okay. So it had an opt out button in case people got aggravated. I thought this was really funny because two people, like two people wrote me back this really nasty email. Why don't you take no for an answer? I said no. And I'm like, it has an opt out button on there. You know, like, don't answer it. But anyway, it was very funny. So, of the ones who answered, I got a 59.2% response rate, which by any measure is a great response rate. And I feel like what, what we learned um, from that, we can, we can sort of take to the bank because that's a lot of people. The survey included demographic questions and questions about certification processes and length of time. And so we gathered a lot of interesting little tidbit facts as well as this um, collection of what people had ended up saying was the most important, part of their, most important part of their training. So what I would like to do right now is show my very first slide. Ah, yay. Um, because my favorite part of the whole survey was this 10-point radio button uh, section where you had, to, you had to rank in order of importance the, the uh, components of your supervisory process. And you couldn't cheat and you couldn't screw it up because it wouldn't, the computer wouldn't register it if you didn't. So we had 10 different items in no particular order. And overwhelmingly, these are the, these are the results. The top three items, as you can see, were, were Relationship to supervisor, um, the consultation process of other supervisors and other friends and other peers, and then uh, therapy. So to me, it's pretty striking. Now, I think there's all kinds of reasons. Curriculum is not unimportant. I think in most places, they didn't have one. A lot of people really didn't even have one because these are people, a lot of the re respondents have been certified for a long, long time. So some of these things were not necessarily, they're not necessarily low on there because they're unimportant. They might be low on there because they were not applicable. But never mind that, I think the, the top three items still come out 
pretty strongly. And they're all about relationship. Every one of them is about relationship, which made me super happy because I'm a relational theorist. So I was really happy about that. But we'll come back to that. So now I have my clicker question. What do you think was the average age of the newly certified supervisor in the 1950s? Take your pick. A, they were in their 20s, B, they were in their 30s, C, in their 40s, and D, in their 50s. The answer is that most people think 30s. The answer is 25. Okay, question number two. What is the average age of the newly certified supervisor? <laughs> what? I missed it. Oh, dang it. Okay, pretend you didn't see it. Okay, go ahead and go. Well, we don't get to play with the toy, but we're out of time anyway. If everybody saw the answer, I'm sure you're not going to cheat. I'm sure you're going to put the one you thought. Because your supervisors would never do that. Okay, we're closing. Interesting. What do you think, Judy? Think they cheated? Okay, so even though you cheated, the answer is... 46.7 is the average. Now that was even almost now four years ago. So I don't, I don't actually know if that has gone up. But if you look at um, my next slide, it's like magic. <gasps> of course, this is sort of overstated, but if we kept going at that rate, <laughs> and actually we're kind of on we're kind of on target already. If you go between if you go to 2014, we're probably about there. We're probably getting clo pressing close to the average age of about 50. If we keep going, you can see <laughs> that we're going to have. Obviously, we're going to turn around at some point, uh, but you can see the point of my uh, panic. It seems like we got some work to do, I think. So, my point is, what is my point? So, oh, the, click to the next slide, because I think this one's really funny. Y'all are going to get really mad at me, but I think it's funny. And, and I should say in my defense, Dennis Kenny thinks it's ageism. I just think it's math. If you do three people at the age of 55 and you spend all, as a center or as a person, you spend all these years training those people, and then you've still got three more retirees, conceivably, in, in 10 years. I mean, again, no offense, maybe everybody lives forever. It's not about that. But, it is, but look at, if you do that same training process, you've got a 30-year work trajectory out of that. I, I'm not saying there's an age cutoff for training. I'm saying we just got to take the numbers seriously to be, in, in my book, in order to be responsible. So, it's time for me to quit, and I'm going to say one quick thing about the um, last finding on, on the last slide, which is that, um, finding number four, oh, I'll skip that part. Presenting really often uh, cuts a year and a half off the training process. That was a fascinating fact that I found. If you presented more than twice or m more a month versus once a month or less, people shaved an entire year and a half off their process. So that's a pretty interesting fact. And that, again, is just math. So, so that's my short version. I think, again, I want to repeat, what will our legacy be? How hard are we working to recruit the young? How much are we looking at the best and the brightest of the students that are coming out of theological education and persuading them that this is a viable 
an exciting career option and that we want them in this process, that we want to encourage them and certainly not so young that they have no experience at all and, and have no, no life wisdom, but, but really that might be at this a while. Um, that's my challenge and I hope we'll spend time talking about it. Thanks.